After reading and prayer, we'll sing number 4949. 49. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the Matthew 26, 6 through 13. <clears throat> now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, and poured it on his head and sat at me. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, whosoever the gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, this that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Would you please bow with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and each day you give us. We're thankful, Father, for each one here, and we pray, Father, for those that are unable to be here. We ask, Father, that you forgive us when we sin and always be with us. And we pray, Father, for those um, in other nations that the world might be at peace and might know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I bid you good morning on this rainy Sunday morning to our Bible study period. For those visiting, we're honored guests, and we're glad that you have decided to be here with us this morning. We have classes for all ages, and we invite you to participate in those classes with us. We'll ask the teachers, nursery, preschool, and elementary school to go at this time. Middle and high school also. Brother Johnny's class from the Auditorium. Johnny's not feeling well this morning. He's not here. So Johnny's class.
try not to blow you all away, but I got to get this microphone high enough to get it out of the way of my coat. Sound okay in the back? Good morning. Good to see everybody. Um, I am going to leave these up here. Joshua and Joshua have been handing out some of these uh, handouts for uh, the worship period. That, but these are these are not for Bible class, but just while it's on my mind, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave these up here. So if you don't have one yet, you may want to grab one in between services. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to come up with a system so that we can, uh, a lot of times the young men will catch the folks uh, as they're coming in back there, but then there's nobody up here or over here. So we may just come up with a system and put them on a table or something, and then it'll uh, eventually it'll get to be a habit where everybody will know to check that. But for right now, I'm just going to leave them right there. We've we've had a week off from our class. We had a great gospel meeting, and uh, everything just really went well with that, I think, as, as well as it could. And, and Brother Phil did a great job and certainly um, really, really enjoyed that. So... But we are going to get back into how we got the Bible um, this morning. Uh, I'm going to just very, very quickly review what we talked about last time, and then we'll, uh, we'll get, pick up where we left off. Uh, we, we began talking about inspiration, looking at Bible claims for inspiration. And as I mentioned to you, and, and by the way, there are also some more of these uh, handouts up here that I gave out two weeks ago. Uh, kind of a rough outline of this study so you understand where we're going uh, at any given time. If, if we're talking about manuscripts, you'll know that we're in uh, you know, major section or at least subsection number four under uh, inspiration, revelation, and communication. But that's a... Uh, does anybody need, need one of these? Okay, there are a few. I've got plenty. But the first thing we have to understand is, is inspiration. Uh, sometimes people claim the Bible is not even inspired. Uh, I heard somebody, I'm trying to remember where I heard this, it was just recently, and I thought about it, and I, I was out, and I couldn't write it down. Sometimes if I don't write stuff down, I don't remember anything. But uh, I, was, I was not really where I could write it down, but I heard the statement actually made during this week uh, when I was out somewhere, might have been out with Brother Phil or something, I, I can't remember, but... Somebody actually made the statement about the Bible. Well, it's been translated and retranslated so many times. How can anybody even know what God said? Uh, well, that's this study. Uh, I submit to you, and of course, the overarching proposition of this whole study is the Bible claims to be the inspired, inerrant, God-breathed Word. It also is that very thing. It's without error. It is, when faithfully translated, the Word of God. It doesn't contain the Word of God. It doesn't become the Word of God. It is God's Word. And so that's, that's our big proposition, that this, this book that we have is the Word of God. It's not corrupted through translation and retranslation or, or through transmission. And we'll see that as we go through this study. Uh, it's not just something that we say, well, you just got to believe it. We're going to look at the evidence because our Lord Himself said, through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 1.18, come now let us reason together. Uh, God's never expected us to believe something just, you know, on blind faith. God says, let's, let's reason together. So uh, this is what we talked about last time. We, we looked at our approach to this study, and that's all on the sheet there, so I'm just going to move right through that. For, for this section on the inspiration, it's important to understand that the Bible does claim inspiration because sometimes people will say that. Well, the Bible doesn't even... Uh, claim to be uh, inspired necessarily. But that's uh, silly as we get, get into this study, as we've already seen looking at the Old Testament two weeks ago. Uh, we're gonna look, we've looked at Old Testament claims. We looked at a definition of inspiration. We're going to look at New Testament claims and some other notes on inspiration, and then we'll notice some conclusions. For inspiration, we notice that this is a technical term. It's, it's theopneustos, uh, if, if I'm pronouncing that right, and I'm not a Greek scholar by any stretch. But it just literally means God breathed. And you've probably heard that before. Uh, many people make this point. God breathed. Uh, God spoke in times past by the fathers. He's spoken in these last days by His Son. Uh, that's inspiration. God is speaking. He's doing it through human means. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. 
we made the point that God is the author of the Bible. Humans just penned the words by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So does the Bible claim inspiration? And this is where we looked at last week, looking at Old Testament. And I'm going to bring these up very quickly because we looked at this already. But over and over again in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, uh, the Lord spake to Moses and said, you know, on and on and on it goes, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue, 2 Samuel 23, 2. God said to Jeremiah, put my words in your mouth. Genesis 6, we, we noted there, we even have the thoughts of God recorded for us. God is thinking that he regrets uh, having created man because man had become so wicked and he determines in his mind to destroy the earth. And of course, then later on, he speaks to Noah. But the men were merely spokesmen for God. <clears throat> we made the point, what good does it do for God to inspire words but stop there? Uh, written scriptures inspired too, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Uh, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation or origination. Uh, graphe there is scripture, and that's, that's writing. And we notice here, here are just some very quick, uh, and, and I'm not going to go back over these. You, <clears throat> you can write, jot down those references if you want to look at them. Uh, again, it would be a whole other study altogether just to look into the proofs of the Bible claims for inspiration. We understand it's one thing to claim it. It's another thing to be what it claims to be. Uh, that's, of course, really in Christian evidences, and, and uh, I, I enjoy studying that as well. And, and probably, Lord willing, at some point we will look at that, uh, just not in this study, because it would, it, would, it would get us so far away by the time we finish that section, we'd probably forget where we'd left off uh, with inspiration. So <clears throat> just a few verses there that, that give some evidence of inspiration about uh, Isaiah 45, 1, the cir circle of the earth, paths of the sea, um, first law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics. Uh, these, these are all things that were there before man ever discovered them. They were in the Bible. Now, this is where we left off. New Testament claims for inspiration. Uh, Jesus' view of inspiration, Matthew 4, 4. Uh, what does he say there? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He, even, he, he thinks words are important, down to the very word. Well, we understand things can be changed by just a word. Um, you can talk about... Uh, I could tell you this morning, you need to join a church. Or I could say, you need to be a member of the church. Well, what's biblical? Well, to say to be a member of the church is biblical. A church implies that there, there could be one of many. But biblically speaking, we read about one church that Jesus purchased with his blood. He died on the cross, he shed his blood, he purchased it. But it's just one. Well, A, of course, implies more than one. Uh, so you, you begin to see just one word. Of course, God told Adam and Eve in the day they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what would happen? Thou shalt surely die. And the devil comes and says, thou shalt not surely die. We just changed one little, one little word. So sometimes a word makes a big difference. Um, Matthew 5, 18. What does he say there? Not the smallest letter or stroke. King, old King James has jot or tittle, but that's, that's what it's talking about. The smallest letter or, or stroke. It's just the tiniest little mark in, in the Hebrew or even in Aramaic, which is a similar language. Uh, not going to pass away till all is fulfilled. So you see the importance of inspiration. It's not just, well, there are sections or bits and pieces. Jesus says it's... It's inspired to uh, what we might say through and through. It gets back to that idea of God breathe. John 14, 26, John 16, 13. Um, the, the comforter, Jesus says, which is the Holy Ghost. Uh, he'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. That's John 14, 26 and 16, 13. He says, how be it when he, <clears throat> the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into what? All truth for he'll not speak of himself or whatsoever things he shall hear that shall he speak and he'll show you things to come so 
the apostles were guided into all truth. Jesus said, when I leave, uh, and there's a whole section there really in John uh, 14, 15, and 16 where Jesus is comforting his disciples. He's about to leave this earth and he's, he's prepping them for that. He's going to die. He's going to uh, be gone for that three-day period. Then he's going to rise from the dead. But even shortly after that, he's going to leave. And so he's, uh, he's sort of strengthening them for the upcoming trial. And he's encouraging them. But he talks a lot in there about the comforter. He says, uh, there, I forget the exact reference, but in that section he says, I will not leave you comfortless. And it's interesting because when you study that word comfortless, what he says there is, it's the same word in James 1.27 where James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless. Well, orphans, we might say. Jesus says to his apostles, I will not leave you orphans. He says, I'm going to send you another comforter. And that's another interesting word study because it's the idea there is, Paul talks about in Galatians 1, I marvel that you're so, so soon removed to another gospel. And that's a, that's a word that means another of a different kind altogether. And that's why he says it's not another of the same kind. Because there's, there's two words there. There's another of a different kind. And then there's another of the same kind. Jesus says, I'm, not, I'm going to send you another comforter. He says, I'm going to send you another one just like me. And of course, that's the unity of the Godhead. So he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. So he says, I'm going to send the Spirit. He's going to guide you into all truth. Um, they're told in Matthew 10, 19, 20, you don't even have to take thought what you're going to say. It burns me up to hear people take this passage today and try to apply this. I have heard, I have to watch myself because I don't want to get ugly, but I have heard lazy, bum, so-called preachers in the religious world today use this passage. And that's all it is, it's laziness. It's somebody that doesn't want to study. It's somebody that doesn't want to get into the Word and they say, well, you know, I just wait and, and, and the Lord's going to lay something on my heart. That was never something that was promised to any of us. This is something Jesus said to the apostles. If you've got the Spirit coming, you don't have to take thought of what to say because he's going to... That's why we call it Holy Spirit baptism. Baptism is a word that's, of course, been corrupted by the religious world as well. It just means an immersion, to dip, to plunge, to overwhelm, sometimes is a definition that's given. So they had this immersion into the Spirit, this overwhelming of the Spirit... They were, they were literally plunged into the Spirit, as it were. And so they, had, they, they had, didn't even have to take thought of what they were going to say. And so for somebody to take that today and try to apply it and just to get into a pulpit uh, without even any kind of preparation whatsoever is an insult to me. And, and I, I just, it's an insult to anybody who's in that audience. And I don't know why people don't just walk out. It's, it's, it's really uh, frustrating. Paul said, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, a couple of these. Somebody get 1 Thessalonians 2.13, please. And Galatians 1.11 and 12 and 1 Corinthians 14.37. i got to watch my time because I don't want to. I want to make sure we get through this section. All right, Paul says something that's very important here. He says, when you received the word, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, as the word of God. Now, I submit to you, that is just as true today. And, and I say this as a preacher of the gospel, that when a man stands in that pulpit or stands up here in front of an audience or stands in a classroom or whatever the case may be, or maybe he's just standing at the back having a conversation, but if the fellow says something and it comes from the word of God... God forbid we ever walk out of those doors and say, well, that's what our preacher believes. I've, I've actually seen situations where a preacher preached the gospel on something and a member in the congregation didn't agree with it and then at the back talking to maybe even a visitor and they say, well, our preacher believes that. We don't believe that. Well, you know, if you've if you got a disagreement and you think it's not coming from the word of God, then by all means, let's, let's get together. Let's study. Let's find out what the Bible says. I want to be doing what the Bible says. I want to be teaching. I sure want to be teaching what the Bible says in light of James 3, 1, that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Maybe we need to sit down with the elders, whatever. But let us never just 
brush it off with a wave of the hand and say, well, that's what the preacher believes. Can you imagine the people in Thessalonica saying, well, that's what Paul believes. We don't believe that. We're, we're going to be, uh, we're gonna be the, the first church of James or, or whatever. You know, we, but that's Paul's belief. They understood what Paul said was gospel. That was the word of God. Which brings us to 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Who's got that? All right. Had a fellow tell me one time, you know, he says, he says in all actuality, uh, Jesus never even claimed to be, um, Jesus never even claimed to be God's son. And he says, you, you, you always want to quote Paul to me. That's what he told me. He says, but, but you know, Paul was just, uh, just a man and, uh, all you Christians, you wanted. To, I found out later. This guy, he, he really claimed to be nothing, but the closest thing he was was a Muslim. Um, but he said, uh, he said, all you Christians, you want to quote Paul all the time. Well, Paul's just another person, you know. And you, you want to quote Jesus, but Jesus never even claimed to be God. Well, first of all, Jesus did claim to be God. That's why they wanted to kill him. Uh, but number two, Paul says very clearly, you you think yourself a prophet? You think yourself to be a spiritual person? acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. That's not a man trying to throw his weight around or be a big shot in the church. That's a man who understands God is speaking through him. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. All right, Paul says, and this is right on the heels of telling the Galatian brethren, I marvel, I'm shocked, brethren, that you are so soon removed from the pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, and now you're over here with another gospel, another of a different kind. And he says, there be some that would trouble you. They're perverting the gospel. And, of course, he goes on and says, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. But he says, he says let me certify you. Let me, let me assure you, brethren, that the gospel that I preach, Paul says, it's not after man. It's not, it doesn't have man as its source. He says, this I received by revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not something I just sat down and thought, oh, a good thought just came to me. I should write that down. He says, no, I was inspired of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, looking at those verses, there's no way you could say that there's no claim for inspiration. Uh, what about New Testament writers who weren't apostles? Sometimes people say, okay, okay, okay. I grant you, Chad, Paul, Matthew, all the apostles, Jesus said the Spirit's going to guide them into all truth, and he did. And so they're inspired. All right, I'll grant you that. And, and Jesus' words are inspired, obviously, being the Son of God. But, you know, there's, there's Mark, and there's Luke, and Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And so somebody may even say, you know, every time you tell me to go to the book of Acts and look at conversion accounts, you're, you're quoting from an uninspired man because he wasn't an apostle. And the apostles received that Holy Spirit baptism. So what about that? Anybody want to... Uh, Y'all know I like to... I like some discussion in class. I don't like to be the only one talking. So anybody have a thought on that? Yes, sir. sir? These were people who were, who were firsthand eyewitnesses, face-to-face, uh, -face, as, as Brother Scott said there. Um, think about this. Let's look at Ephesians 3, 3 through 5. I, I'm going to go ahead and get ahead a little bit while you're, while you're turning there. In Acts 8, 18, there's a man named Simon. Simon obeys the gospel, and, and they... Philip, of course, preached the gospel in Samaria. Simon, the sorcerer, is one of those who obeys the gospel. And then, though, they send somebody to Samaria. They send, does anybody remember? The church in Jerusalem sent them. Well, Philip was there originally. He preached the gospel. But they send Peter, I think I heard somebody say, and Peter and John, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly. But they send them to Samaria. Why? Philip was preaching. Why does Peter and, Peter and John, if, like I said, if I'm remembering that correct, it's Peter and somebody, another apostle. But why, why did they need to send them? 
they're going to lay hands on them. Why? Why doesn't Philip do that? Philip couldn't. Because, and that's verse 18 of Acts chapter 8. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Spirit was given. Then he offers them money. He says, I want that. I want to be able to do that. Peter says, you don't have part or lot in this matter. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. And that's when he tells them what we sometimes refer to as the, the second law of pardon. When you're, when you're not right with the Lord and you're a Christian already, you need to repent and pray for forgiveness. But Simon understood what a lot of folks today don't understand. And that is that to get the ability to do miraculous things, you had to have an apostle lay hands on you. One of the miraculous gifts was prophecy. Prophecy. Now, Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, who's got that? Okay, hold on just a second right there. Paul says, he made this known to me, that's still Paul, an apostle, by revelation. And, and when you read, you can understand. And that destroys everybody's uh, argument that sometimes you'll hear folks say, well, who can understand the Bible anyways? I just can't understand it. I would study it, but I can't understand it. Uh, we can't all agree on the Bible, right? Because nobody can understand it. Well, Paul says you can. And Paul's writing that by inspiration. So uh, go ahead and finish that section out. Okay, it was not known before, it wasn't, it wasn't made known, it was, it was hidden. That's not to say that God was trying to hide something, God was working a plan, and God's plan all along was that his son would come, he would die on the cross, there would be the church, and then everything would come clear. And now in hindsight, sometimes that happens even today in secular matters, in hindsight something becomes so clear that you just couldn't see before, it would have been so muddied, uh, and, and you, would have, you would not have been able to decipher that before. But now in hindsight, you say, oh, okay, I got it. I get it now. Well, that's the way it is with the gospel. Now, uh, here we are in 21st century looking back. It's so clear. But that's the way God always designed it to be. He, he revealed it. But he revealed it by his holy apostles and prophets. So, there are apostles who are inspired. There are also prophets who on whom the apostles laid hands and so they would have been inspired acts 242 has got that and then somebody else grab second timothy 1 6 please all right they continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine now is it their doctrine we understand it's Jesus' doctrine. Jesus sent the Spirit. The Spirit speaks through the apostles. So there are people, as, as was mentioned by Brother Scott, that they were there. They were in that presence. They were fellowshipping with them. They were right there with the apostles. But then there are also people on whom the apostles laid hands, and they received this gift of prophecy. And then who's got 2 Timothy 1.6? All right, so Paul tells Timothy, I, I have, uh, I've laid hands on you and you have this gift, and so use that to God's glory. So there were New Testament writers, there were New Testament speakers, by the way. Not all of them wrote. There were many others who never sat down and by inspiration penned a book of the New Testament. But they preached and they taught. You, you think about it. It makes sense. What if we are living in first century and here we are, maybe the town of Bremen, Georgia, or wherever it may be, in Asia Minor somewhere, and Paul comes into town, and there are no Christians, so he goes to the synagogue, and he begins teaching, and people start obeying the gospel. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love studying uh, the life of Marshall Keeble. He, he, was, he was very much like the Apostle Paul. Brother Keeble would go into a town, there'd be not a single black Christian there. When he went to Atlanta, Georgia, not a single black Christian. He sets up a tent, and he just starts preaching. And then people start obeying the gospel. And next thing you know, there's a, a thriving congregation there. So, but Paul goes and, and he teaches. And, and just, again, in our example, here we are in Bremen. Paul teaches. He baptizes some folks. So we decide uh, maybe, maybe Paul's spent two or three weeks in the city. And now there's 50 or 60 of us. Brand new Christians. 
and we say, all right, we're no longer under Jewish law. We're under the law of Christ. He died for our sins. Okay, now what? Well, Paul says, Paul says the law of Moses is done away and the Ten Commandments are done away, so we don't keep the Sabbath. So I, I remember him saying something about we need to assemble on Sunday. Well, what do we do? Well, you know, in synagogue we always sang. Do we sing? Do we need to do that? What, you know, you, you, you begin to see the questions that arise. Now today, if that were to happen in this city and when Brother Keeble would go into cities and preach, they'd say, well, what do we do now? Brother Keeble would say, well, let's open up, you know, y'all, y'all open up your New Testament and study and learn how to obey God and how to worship and how to serve Him. But you see, if you're living in first century, you don't have a New Testament. Not written. Now, the books were being compiled. This was a, an ongoing, continual process. But for several years, nothing was written. So how do they know? Well, Paul, before he leaves town, if he's going somewhere else, so it may be in some situations in Corinth, um, in, in uh, Antioch, Paul would locate himself for a period of time and he would teach and help ground those Christians. But maybe if he has to leave, or maybe even after he leaves, they're still young Christians. He was in uh, Antioch, I think, maybe the space of a couple of years, or maybe that's Ephesus I'm thinking about. But uh, when he leaves, he lays hands on somebody. They've got the gift of prophecy. There, there were nine spiritual gifts, and that's really another study for another time. But these gifts were designed for the edification of the church. In fact, Paul has to write back to the church at Corinth and say, hang on now, y'all are getting out of hand with this because you're starting to think that certain gifts are better than other gifts. Some, some people in Corinth got the idea that, man, if I can speak in tongues, I got, I got a leg up on all you other folks. And Paul says, look, you know, people are going to come into your services. They're going to think you're insane. You're just up there jabbering and you don't even have anybody to interpret. He says, you know, covet earnestly the best gifts. And he goes on and says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And he talks about love in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. But there were these people who had hands laid on them, received the gift of prophecy. Uh, it was to help instruct, ground the church when they didn't have, at that time, a written New Testament. So here's a good... I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an artist or the son of an artist, so sometimes I just do the best I can, but I think it'll get the point across. God spoke through his son. God in Sunday times and in diverse manners spake in times passed by the prophets, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. All right? So God speaks by means of the son. That's the one in whom is vested all authority. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power or all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. God says, my son hear ye him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You're going to listen to him. That's the authority. He has all authority. All doesn't leave anything out. Then Jesus vested authority into the apostles by means of the Spirit. And he says, I'm going to send the Spirit. He's going to guide you into all truth. And so the apostles received this message from the Spirit who received it from the Son. And then the apostles would lay hands uh, well, there you got the apostles, and we looked at those references already. And then you have the apostles who would lay hands on people. They would receive the Spirit, and that's what we refer to as the prophets. And so they would often uh, write down their message or preach it to the congregation. All right? Does that make sense? I hope so, because I, I, I was trying to... I like, I'm a visual person, and sometimes I'm, I'm, I need something visual, but I'm not a, I'm not a good artist. <laughs> Any questions thus far, by the way? Y'all have to holler at me. Y'all have to just say, hey, stop. <laughs> I, don't, I don't ever mind that. I, in fact, I, I enjoy, we, we did questions and answers at our youth day yesterday, and that's, uh, that's one of the greatest things, I think, um, and, and one of the most underused things today, because if people have questions, you want to get to them and answer them. No questions at all? That must be. Either that or nobody wants to speak up. All right. Some other notes on inspiration before we close out this section. And I better move. We're getting close on time again. I don't want to have to start to have smoke coming out of my ears like I did two Wednesday nights ago. The difference between inspiration and revelation. Um, oh, whoops. I thought I had that on my slide. Uh, inspiration is uh, what we would say the, well, revelation is the revealing of facts. 
and truths by God to humans. Uh, keep these straight. That's revelation. God is revealing something, and you can almost hear the word reveal in revelation. Nature is a revelation of God. Nature screams, and Romans 1 tells us that, uh, Psalm 19 tells us that, that nature just screams to us that God is. Now, that's all nature tells us about God. Nature just blares out that there is a God, and he is, he's alive and well. But now if you want to know, well, who is God? What does he like? What does he not like? Why did he put us here? What's going to happen to us when we die? Those are all questions that nature can't answer. And so nature is a revelation from God. That's what we would sometimes refer to as general revelation. But then there's special revelation. In fact, 1 Corinthians... Am I getting ahead of myself here? I am. Um, hold on. I'll come to that. Inspiration, though, is the process by which God guided the writing down of facts and truths. So revelation is the revealing of them. Inspiration is the process by which they are put down in written form. So here's a man who's inspired. He writes it down. So just a, just a note on the difference there. Now, it's also important to note that inspiration does not mean sinlessness. Um, you have David. Was David inspired of God? Absolutely. Was David sinless? One word for you. Uriah. Uriah. That, that David, one of the biggest mistakes he ever made in his life. And, and egregious, eyes wide open, we might say, kind of sin. He was severely rebuked for that. He suffered many consequences of that. So he wasn't sinless, but he was inspired. Peter is another example. He denied Jesus three times. Well, was he inspired? Sure. That doesn't mean he never made mistakes. He never messed up. Uh, but inspiration did preserve the integrity, the truthfulness of the message as it's being written down. And so it's not a... Um, it's not a 24-7 process, but when God inspires Peter or David or Paul or whomever it may be, and they sit down and they're writing, yeah, they're inspired. They're inerrant. He's guiding that pen, as it were. But it's not a process that's active every moment of every day, as we see from the examples just of Peter and David. Uh, inspiration extended to a variety of subjects. Um, just just very quickly on this, I, I, we, could, we could get into this more, but just... A quick note here. Some people say that spiritual sections of the scripture are inspired, spiritual sections. Um, I don't even know where that came from. That's silly because uh, people have this idea that certain sections of the Bible are inspired, certain sections are not. And really, if that's true, we'd have to wade through which sections are inspired and which ones aren't. And at the end of the day, who gets to say which sections are and which sections aren't? The Bible says it is God-breathed. Every word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, there are certain principles to take into account, such as who is speaking, to whom are they speaking, and looking at context and things like that. But let us never get into this foolishness of thinking, well, there are certain sections of the Bible that are inspired and certain sections that are not. I had a fellow tell me one time, trying to argue for evolution. This was a gospel preacher, supposedly. And he says, well, your mistake, Chad, and this was a very condescending uh, arrogant fellow, uh, Brother Phil knows him real well, Chris, and uh, he, he's, he's dealt with him as well. And this, this fellow, is, it's a shame that he uh, leads so many people astray on the, stuff like this. But he says, he says well, Chad, your, your big mistake from the start is that you are trying to take the book of Genesis, which is law, and you're trying to take it and make it a history lesson or a scientific lesson. Well, no, I'm trying to take the Bible at face value when it says it is inerrant. When it says it is inspired, God breathed. Yeah, Genesis is not meant to be a science lesson. But when it says in six days God made the heavens, the earth, and all that in them is in Exodus 20, verse 2, which is also part of the law, I understand that's ma that main purpose is law. But does God in the giving of law tell lies? Give me a break. We know better than that. So inspiration extends to a variety of subjects, not it's not just, you know, sometimes people say, well, you take a section of poetry and you try to make that uh, teach something that it's not ever meant to teach. The Bible doesn't teach error, and it claims inspiration through and through. We can understand God's revelation. We pointed that out a while ago from Ephesians 3, 3 to 5. The very words are inspired. Um, let me, this is what I was going to read a while ago, talking about um, inspiration. 
Uh, I want to read this from the New American Standard because it gets the, the essence of what, what's being said here better than just about any translation I've seen. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, we, the apostles, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen nor an ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those that love him. That's a reference to the Bible, by the way, not heaven. Sometimes we talk about that in reference to heaven. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? You want to know what I'm thinking? I've got to tell you. There's no way you can really truly know what's on my mind unless I tell you. Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we, the apostles, have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. That's the idea. How humbling it is to realize when you study the Bible that God says to you and to me, you're on my mind. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about your soul and how in spite of your many mistakes, your many shortcomings, your many sins, that you can come and live with me forever. And I'm going to write a letter and I'm going to tell you just how to do that I'm going to send my son and he's going to redeem your soul and in this letter I'm going to tell you how to take advantage of that and then when this life is over you can come before me on the day of judgment and in spite of all that you've done that's wrong I'll look at you and I'll see the blood of my son and I'll say well done enter thou into the joy of thy Lord that is sobering and that is humbling to realize the very thoughts of God are right here in this book. And his thoughts are on me. And they're on you. That is what we talk about when we talk about inspiration. It's the thoughts of God being written down by human means. Uh, the words and the writing are inspired. Second Thessalonians 2.15, Paul says, Hold fast to traditions that you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Word would be speaking, as I'm speaking now, the oral spoken word. Epistle is what? It's not the wife of an apostle. <laughs> Ever heard that of the little kids that were in Sunday school and the teacher asked, what's an epistle? And the one little boy said, that's the wife of an apostle. Um, an epistle is a written letter. It's just another word for a letter. I don't know where that came from. Is that Latin maybe? I'm not really sure. Um, but by spoken word or our epistle, well, word, that's Acts 17, 1 through 9. Did Paul ever go to Thessalonica? I believe he did. He preached the gospel there, verbally, orally. Did he ever write to Thessalonica? Well, he wrote a book named 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. So he says, hold it fast, whether by word or our epistle. 2 Timothy 3.16, possibly a reference to the New Testament there, and when he says all scripture, uh, he says, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, verse 15. That is no doubt, that's Old Testament. But then he says, all scripture is God-breathed. Well, that very well could be a reference to the New Testament, because this is Paul's last book. He says in chapter 4, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. He's about to die. All right, very quickly, somebody grab 1 Timothy 5.18 for me, please, and we'll close with that. All right, don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's Deuteronomy 25.4. That's scripture, Paul says. And... The laborer is worthy of his reward. That's Luke 10, 7. Who said that? Jesus? That's New Testament. They're both Scripture. That gets it all. Old Testament, New Testament. It's inspired of God. Let's close with these thoughts. Oh, never mind. Uh, you see just a little diagram there of the church. Jesus, the cornerstone, the apostles, the prophets. Christians are living pillars. Here's what I wanted to close with. If the Bible is the verbal, plenary, inspired word of God, we must study it carefully. It's not an option. We've got to do it. I can talk over those kids. I promise you. We must allow it to guide our thinking and our beliefs. If it is what it claims to be, we've got to guide our lives by this book. 
We must obey it in our daily actions. That's why this study is so important. And next lesson, we're going to look at the making of ancient books and see how it goes from revelation from heaven to writing it down in some kind of a written form because the form has changed. We didn't always have these nice bound books with leather and paper that we have now. So how did it come to us from different various writing materials to what we have today? That's what we'll start with next week. Thank you very much. We got through it. Yes, ma'am. Say that again. Yes, it would be it would be special revelation. So yeah, right. And then the Bible would be right. And, and that's what I was getting at when I talk about the, uh, you know, how do you know what God likes, what He doesn't like? Well, that's His mind, that's His thoughts, and it's revealed to us in the Bible. Oh, thank you.